go. Hopefully, my slides come up. So I'm going to talk to you today about something that I think can be transformative for healthcare. So I just want you to suspend disbelief for a moment. If A, then B. So I'm telling you I can do this. Deliver high quality medical imaging, better quality than MRI, PET, CT, all of these things we call by initials. Make it a thousand dollars, a thousand times cheaper, and put it in a wearable or a portable. And so, if you could do that, we could save a lot of lives. An MRI saved my life 24 years ago today, finding my brain tumor. Has it saved anybody else's life, diagnosing a cancer, heart disease, and so forth? It's expensive, though. The cost hasn't changed in decades. But if we could make a thousand times cheaper way of seeing inside of our body in high resolution, in a surgery we could figure out, do we have it all out, rather than just there's a very few specialized surgical suites globally where you can like roll the patient into the MRI or, and then pull it out, pull the patient out and see if you catch it and back in and back out. Like why? That's pretty awkward. It's cool, but it's expensive and there aren't very many of them. We could put diagnostic technology like this inside of ambulances. In fact, the number one cause of disability in America right now is complications due to stroke. Because there's two basic types of stroke. There's the clot type stroke and then there's the burst type stroke. If you have the clot type stroke, you can take a drug to burst it. If you've got the burst type stroke, you can take a drug to clot it. But if you get the drug wrong, patient dies. So today that means access to medical imaging within two hours of a stroke. If you live too far away, tough luck. You're not going to walk or talk for the rest of your life. So if we could diagnose the type of stroke closer to where the stroke happened, we could make it so the patient could walk and talk again. Um, and there's a million things we can do in the ER and ICU with monitoring a patient if we could lower the cost of medical imaging. In fact, a lot of technologies are being developed with an assumption that an MRI or a CT is $1,000. In the case of a CT, you also get radiation. You can only have a certain number of them in your life, or they actually give you cancer because of the radiation. But why not have this at home? Like, why not be able to see inside of our bodies? Like, Angelie jo Jolie um, cut off part of her body because she had the BRCA gene. I could envision that we could make a bra where we could monitor um, anybody for high risk for breast cancer or any other type of cancer where you could check at home, like you do for hypertension now, if you've got a blood pressure cuff or a thermometer. You could just see, um, the answer to basically three questions. Is it getting bigger? Is it getting smaller? Is it staying the same size? That's totally different than thinking about diagnosis now because the cost is so expensive. And then there's the biological basis of brain disease. Right now, the way we diagnose depression, for example, is you answer a series of questions. Are you sleeping all the time? Have you gained weight? Do you have thoughts of suicide? If you answer yes to that and the litany of other questions, you're clinically depressed. And the way you're not clinically depressed anymore is if you start answering no to those questions. It's very subjective. But a study published last summer with 1,200 fMRIs, that's a video form of MRI, of patients with clinical depression showed patterns of different types of depression, like anhedonia, that's the absence of hedonism, like no joy versus anxiety, different kind of. With these patterns, we could see if the therapy was getting, making the patient better or worse much more quickly. The average clinically depressed patient loses 12 years of employment from the depression. And your chances of depression over a lifetime are about, call it 25%, but if you've lived in a war zone, it more than doubles. It's a huge problem, and many others. This can have an impact to help us understand our minds by letting us see in high resolution in a precision way inside of our minds. And then, you know, like, I never had a conversation with my grandfather. He had a massive stroke before I was born, so his speech center was hit. We've shown that 
you could actually communicate speech telepathically to a computer just by monitoring certain areas of your, of your brain. But there's more, and maybe the most radical part of this is not just what it can do to your body, but what it can, can enable in the next communication medium, which I think is brain-computer communication. This is a, about a decade old. This is work by Jack Gallant at UC Berkeley, University of California at Berkeley, where he, he started using rats, then he moved up to macaques, and then he started using graduate students as lab rats, putting them in MRI scanners for hundreds of hours, making them watch YouTube videos, recording how their brains lit up, how they reacted to those scans. What fMRI measures is oxygen use, millimeter by millimeter in your head, and making maps of that with the images the students looked at. Then a new cl video clip was shown, and the computer inferred with just the scan library of the fMRI data of the graduate students what it thought the student was looking at. That's decade old. And it's pretty uncomfortable to lay in an MRI scanner for uh, hundreds of hours. And so with higher resolution and more ease uh, of, of, of um, you know, comfort in wearing something, we could do so much more. In fact, I showed live on stage at TED last year us achieving a billion times higher <laughs> resolution than fMRI. So this is, this is coming. And there are profound legal and moral and ethical implications, but the goods are really, the goods I feel outweigh the bads in a profound way. It gives us the opportunity to understand our brains and maybe control ourselves better. And maybe, you know, if we take it even further, like if we understood each other, would it end war? Um, because right now we have a dialogue problem and it, ultimately, you know, here's the thing, I bring this up, you might say, stay away from that telepathy stuff, that medical imaging stuff is good, but sorry, like, if you make a law that you can't use it on your head, you're not dealing with the, the two billion people in the world that suffer from brain disease. So I think this will go pretty fast if we think of lowering the cost of medical imaging. People will use it on their, their heads to communicate. And we, the reason I talk about it is because we have to define what it means to be responsible there. Also, we can focus the ultrasound down. I'm going to show you how this works. I haven't showed you yet. We use ultrasonic pings and camera chips and red light to replace the functionality of a two-ton magnet with liquid helium and superconducting magnets. And we focus ultrasound down, and we can, we can actually ablate tissue, so surgery without the knife, open the blood-brain barrier, deliver microdosing of drugs at the right intensity at the right spot. So imagine a chemo dose at 100x lower, but the right intensity wherever you need it. So MRI um, into a portable, a wand, a wearable, or something the size of a smartphone with pretty profound, profound um, implications. I was running, I have to admit, um, three years ago, advanced consumer electronics at Facebook, and I knew some advances were gonna come down the pike in the trillion dollar manufacturing infrastructure where I've lived and breathed and shipped billions of dollars worth of consumer electronics on the hairy edge of physics for the last couple decades after my brain tumor, because um, I needed health insurance. I'm American. I would have probably done a multimedia art. But I'm going to show you how this works. I have my cell phone out for a reason. Your body is translucent to red light. You see that light? That's just my, the, uh, I don't want to blind anybody, but um, yeah. So it goes right through. X-rays, gamma rays, the fields of two-ton magnetic um, bores also go through your body. But guess which one's cheaper? <laughs> like, by a lot. The problem is the red light scatters. And everybody thought that scattering was random. I'm going to skip this for a bit. So red light, right? And then we focus these ultrasonic pings down. And where we focus the ultrasonic pings, the light changes color ever so slightly. Because we use a, a laser instead of a flashlight. We can change the color. And then we record the color shifted light with a hologram. We record a hologram on a bare camera die, very similar to the camera die in your iPhone. 
that has pixel sizes that are the size of the wavelength of light, which enables us to record holograms. So just to go back for a moment, this is super important because three quarters of humanity lacks access to medical imaging, and that access hasn't changed significantly in the 25 years since I had my brain tumor, nor has the price. And so there's a lot that can be done if we completely rethink it. So we have, and we've made three new components, a new kind of laser, a new kind of ultrasonic chip that can be made in existing silicon factories in Asia, and new kinds of camera chips very similar to the type that are shipping in, in the smartphones you all have. For the past five years, we've had camera chips with pixel sizes that, there's, that are the size of the wavelength of light, but nobody's really used them en masse to record the waves in the wavelength of light. I'm a physicist by training. I'll explain to you a bit more about it. But a common question I get asked is, what about skull and bones? So here's the sort of short course in optics. Black absorbs light. <laughs> white reflects light. Or, and so the white just scatters um, the light through the bone. So that's real human skull. You can buy it at skullsunlimited.com. We really did. And uh, the light goes through it. And so here's just a little cartoon of how this all works. We focus an ultrasonic ping down. We do the ultrasound first for a reason that's going to sound obvious when I say it. But um, sound travels slower than light. So you see the lightning, and then you hear the thunder, right? And so then we bring in the light. The light that goes through that ping changes color ever so slightly. And so what we can do is bring in from the side um, color-changed light uh, uh, to beat against this. And we make, by, by recording these two beams of light together, what's called a hologram or these interference patterns. And we can decode them just like Rosalind Franklin decoded this iconic image of X-ray diffraction to reveal the structure of DNA for the first time. It took her a while. She didn't really get full credit for it until she was dead. But we can do that at a million times a second. And so here's where we are. We started, I, I, I quit my job not knowing if this would work, just, just thinking, boy, every brain cell in consumer electronics is focused on VR and AR. And so I saw these things coming down the pike to enable augmented reality, which the only money maker so far in augmented reality has literally been Pokemon Go. So <laughs> these improvements that enable us to do this were put in place in the factories. Tens of billions of dollars were spent to enable next generation Pokemon Go. And I just thought, great, you guys go do that. I'm going to go check out if we can do something here. And it's, it's come out pretty well. So this is where we are this year in an alpha kit and then a shrink to enable, you know, like a tricorder, a hat, a wand, get these things in ambulances. So here's some of the first images that we got. Well, actually, these are images from about a month ago where we compare. These are crossed toothpicks in a phantom tissue. A phantom tissue optically mimics real flesh and blood as well as ultrasonically mimics. And that's the MRI. So, you know, there's, it's a different image quality. This one was done last weekend. Here's just some slices that we took. We don't slice the kidney, we image inside of the kidney, which is very blood-laden. And so we looked inside the kidney and then compared it to MR and ultrasound, and the image quality that we're getting is, is arguably better. We're not at the end of that. We're in small rats right now, small animal imaging rats right now, and um, We'll be in human trials next year, but doing the rats first to, um, you know, basically test this. So here's the thing. What this means is false positives. I get a question about false positives, and it's like, okay, like you, you do your blood pressure cuff and you get a weird reading. You just do it again. It takes almost no time. Or you, you know, you measure your temperature and you get a weird reading. You do it again you really care about the answer to those three questions if we can change the cost structure and the complexity of, of doing this. And, you know, a lot of people come up after me when I talk about this and say, you know, they really hate the noise of the MRI 
and they're glad I'm getting rid of it. And I'm just going to say this right now. I don't care about that. I think MRI is amazing technology. Tough it out, wear earplugs. <laughs> Seriously, or it's so cramped. It's amazing. The problem is it's super expensive. And um, so here's, um, yeah, so with better, with better um, understanding of disease progression by also seeing deep in our body, we can have a better understanding of early things. So where we are right now is uh, we're in prototype. And we've made the new kinds of lasers, the new kinds of camera chips and ultrasonic chips. We're scanning small animals and... Uh, and we'll have an alpha kit at the end of the next year, human trials next year, and probably beta kits. So this is coming fast because it's consumer electronics. And um, we're here just trying to figure out really, you know, I, I'm in Silicon Valley. It's tech week every week. We're, we're, we are perceived as myopic, trying to come here, talk about it, and figure out, you know, how to collaborate and make this stuff happen. This is all way bigger than our little company. It's how we work um, in the infrastructure of the world to make it happen. My most previously most successful startup was called One Laptop Per Child. Um, as an MIT professor, I created, a, architected a $100 laptop and made with my much more famous co-founder, Nicholas Negroponte, um, a multi-billion dollar not-for-profit startup that catalyzed $30 billion of revenue for our for-profit partners and became the fastest growing consumer electronic category ever recorded. And most importantly, transformed the lives of hundreds of millions of children in the developing world. And so part of that was as a startup, figuring out how to work with NGOs, with the health industry, like in this case, health industry, in that case, education industry, but, but the big companies, the little companies, everybody, the universities and so forth. And so really it won't happen unless we all enable these things to happen. So medical imaging for a thousand X lower cost. And uh, that's all I have to say. I think the panelists have, I've got two minutes left on the clock, but I cede it to the panel and uh, thank you. Hey, remarkable. And hopefully going to talk about something a bit more exciting than Pokemon Go. Uh, but that really is up to Dr. Jack Kreindler. So can jo Dr. Jack come up on stage and uh, welcome his fellow panelists, Kwong Du, Sunil Wadwani, Joanna Shields. Thank up. you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, fascinating. Every time I hear Mary Lou speak, I am always aghast at how, uh, how medicine is going to change. Um, has everybody seen the recent stuff on TV with uh, a very kind of ginger, gingerly looking Trump uh, standing next to the Queen at various sort of things? Well, apart from that being quite funny, um, this marks the 75th anniversary of the D-Day landings this year, which were remarkable because what the D-Day landings started to do was to end a war a battle against something which we thought was potentially unbeatable. Um, but what we learned from that, and the analogy of that, and what we're going to be talking about in this panel, is that it wasn't because of brute force that we ended the war, that we overcame this grand challenge. It was because of data, it was because of intelligence, and then, more importantly, not just having data and the permission to use it, um, but actually doing something about it. It's data, it's intelligence, it's planning, and then it's convincing people like me to actually act. And this is going to be the crux of, of our discussion today. Um, and to have that discussion, um, we have obviously Mary Lou, who has already introduced herself, but also Joanna Shields from Benevolent, uh, Sunil Wadwani, who's come a very long way as well for, who, from, from the iGate uh, and, and WIAI Foundation, um, and, and also Kong Do from uh, Samsung, who's also traveled a very, very long way. And so thank you, first of all, very, very much for taking the time and traveling such a long way for us today. Please welcome our, our panelists. Um, my mum thought it was good that I studied medicine 
because she thought it must definitely be a job for life. You know, North London, Jewish mum, great. Um, so I'm a bit worried that I'm out of a job pretty soon. Tell us what you guys are doing and, and what is going to possibly put me out of that wonderful n career that my mum thought I'd be doing until I was 65 years old. <laughs> Joanna, why didn't you, tell, why didn't you start? Well, oh yeah, we've got microphones. Uh, microphones, that's good. Um, I, I am CEO of an exciting company here in London called Benevolent AI. And what we do is we are, um, we're looking at the challenge of, you know, for all of you guys who've suffered the horrible experience of someone you love, you know, being diagnosed with a debilitating disease and then realizing there's no treatment for it. If you think about it, there's 13,000 untreated diseases that are out there today. And what Benevolent AI are doing is we're trying to organize all of the world's biomedical data and to link that to um, proprietary data sets, to um, clinical data, patient level data, and really open up the possibility of understanding better the underlying cause of disease and addressing the other big issue in, in medical care, and that is that the, the drugs that we do have have such low efficacy rates that the top 10 selling drugs in, in the US right now, the efficacy rates are between 30 and 50%. So what we're trying to do is unlock the underlying cause of disease and develop a treatment that is targeted to that particular patient endotype that addresses the very specific mechanism behind their disease and then we design a molecule to hit that target. Okay, so nothing that's particularly gonna put me out of a job, just possibly no, treat. Not yet. Okay, that's good. That's good. My mum will like you. Um Kong, what what are you what what are you doing to put me out of a job? Um <laughs> So, no. so just to share a couple of minutes of background, as Joanna did. Uh, I'm from India originally, I'm an engineer. Uh, went to the US, went to Carnegie Mellon, and since then I've started a series of companies uh, in the technology space. Uh, the largest of these grew to over 34,000 employees and sold it a couple of years back. So you learn something about how to scale technology-based organizations uh, with that. What's relevant for the discussion here is, in addition to the companies that I have, I also have two nonprofit foundations, uh, both happen to be in India. One is a healthcare nonprofit that I started five years ago, and we use it, we basically use um, innovation, data analytics, to transform primary health systems in really low income settings, in rural parts of India, urban slums, and so on. So today we're running several hundred clinics in the worst parts of India, Last year, we treated over 5 million people with free health care, and that number is growing dramatically every year. Relevant to this uh, discussion, a year ago, my brother and I started an artificial intelligence institute in India, also a nonprofit. And the idea is how do, we, how do we apply AI for social good? How do we help people earning less than 2 or $3 a day in areas like healthcare, education, and so on? So I would say, Jack, not to worry. Medical background, huge need for folks like you. Uh, uh, and even more so than in the rich world, the developed world, we have a giant need for people with a medical background in low and middle income countries. And even in those countries, especially when you get outside the metro areas, there's a huge shortage. It's going to be there for a long, long time. But AI can play a dramatic, transformative role in helping us overcome that shortage of medical personnel. Yes. Fantastic. I've just been seeing the ticker for my pension fund, which has just gone up as a result of... <laughs> Kong. Um, my background is I'm a biochemist by training. I um, started doing medical research when I was 14. Um, eventually made it to McKinsey, where I stayed for 17 years and helped build up the healthcare and high-tech practices with the firm. And since then, I've been a serial chief strategy officer for big companies, Lenovo, Pack Electronics, um, Merck, which is known as MSD outside of the US. And I currently lead the global strategy group for Samsung, for all of Samsung's um, businesses. I'm also an active serial entrepreneur. I've started five companies, right? And the context for today is actually a company I started called Carevisor, where we use artificial intelligence to help make healthcare real time, 24 seven, through a completely different interface, right? So patients should not have to wait to call up Jack in the middle of the night, get his answering uh, service, and then hopefully somebody will call them back. The patient should be able to just talk to an avatar 
that then should be able to help him or her middle of the night, weekends, whatever it is. So Jack, our, what we're hoping to do is actually not put you out of a job, but actually make you more effective doing what you do instead of actually having to spend a lot of time ineffectively on things that shouldn't be done in your practice. So I can be playing more golf at the same time looking at your patients. Excellent. Um, you, you, uh, Sunil, you made a very, very important point. Um, and that is about technology being applied not just to countries where we have greater resources, but also to those where we are lacking resources um, and where there are far fewer of me per capita. And I think this is a very interesting point. I, I recently was given the privilege of interviewing the outgoing chief medical officer for the United Kingdom, Dame Sally Davis. And she said that despite all of the great things she's done, like, like setting up Genomics England and uh, really putting antimicrobial resistance to the forefront of, of the world stage, um, that the greatest gap that she saw, having been in office for 10 years, was the growing gap between health span and lifespan. So we have, we have become, we've, we're living longer, but we become sicker at the same time. But in fact, the lowest two deciles of wealth are actually getting sicker earlier. So net-net, all we have done in the last decade, with despite everything that we have tried, is increase the gap between health span and lifespan, with your financial position being one of the key problems that is driving that, that greater gap. Um, we will help people like me, I'm sure, do more. But what fundamentally do we need to do to direct our efforts towards the developing world? Obviously, Mary Lou, I mean, you've got a lot of things to say about this because your technology is right. radically cheaper than what a lot of people um, I come for a have. from a country where one in five dollars spent is on health care. It can't keep getting more expensive. Of course the poor are suffering. I mean... Of course, and, and uh, the bureaucracy they have to navigate through to get care is so difficult that when you're sick, you can't do that well. If you don't have a family member to do it for you, lots of luck. So, the, but the key part of it is just lower the cost, right? Then we can change the rules if we just lower the cost, right? Even like guidelines right now for breast imaging globally. Um, breast imaging is... Sure, if I'm feedback. Okay. Yeah, maybe use that. To that yeah. instead. Yeah. That's yeah. So, um, the, the, uh, 10x uh, more scans should happen just to follow existing uh, guidelines, just for breast cancer health, just just for one thing. It's just p we aren't meeting even what we think the guidelines should be, let alone changing the guidelines. So, in 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 reaching, um, we have the internet everywhere. That happened, right? So this is something that you're. Maybe you should speak about it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we know that, the, that in the case of um, radiologists, there's some new stuff for them to do to understand disease progression. But if it's just diagnosing you know, the cancers, we know that most, most AI machine learning programs are, are better at it. So great, that's cheaper, fantastic. Let's stop the fight. Like We can s understand it about earlier disease progression. and. You know, I think at that same meeting where you were interviewing the outgoing head of NHS, somebody said the biggest thing you could do for cardiac health, which gets half, half of us very round numbers, cancer's going to kill us, the other half heart disease. I don't know, you're the doctor. I'm not that kind of doctor. Um, so, like, if you could see what that cheeseburger you ate did inside of your arteries, if you could see. So how do, how do we actually work on our own health? Maybe if we could see what was happening in our bodies, we could, could work on it better. Maybe there's a lot of, there's a lot of efforts uh, towards that. I think many of you are trying different things, but how do we work on, um, how do we move it from sick care to health care? Can I just add to that? Of course. Um, to your point, um, I totally believe it's all about reducing the cost of health care. I think reducing cost of health comes in two different ways. One is actually reducing the per incident cost, but the other is actually how do you avoid the cost altogether? If you can treat something earlier to avoid something more complicated later on. And for example, we talked about medication not being very effective, but the reality is right now, 
most patients are not adhering to whatever care plan that they've been given by their clinician, whether it's to exercise, take your medication, and so forth. So I'd like to sh show you something real quickly. Okay. Come on. Hello? Hello, I'm calling from CareVisor. Could I please speak with Kong? This is Kong. I'm getting slightly worried about my job right now. Come on. Well, the whole point here is that this, this demo, <laughs> <laughs> it always goes, let me try it this way. What should I do if I cannot feel my baby kick? Terrible. It's definitely, so it's it's definitely a demo. <laughs> Well, it, this is actually a live platform right now. <laughs> but the whole point is you can use artificial intelligence to sense on a real-time basis what's happening with a patient, right? If a patient's trending low or high in their glucose, you can actually intervene, get them to take some insulin, drink some juice, whatever it is. If a patient, after a rehab, a cardiac um, rehab program is not walking, get them up to walk. Very, very basic things. Remind them to take their medication. We can do this 24-7. That's actually how you get patients to adhere to whatever guidelines or care plans they're on. That's how you help to avoid the costs. That's actually how you help to reduce the overall healthcare system costs. Let me uh, add another dimension to this. So every year, close to six million babies and children under the age of five die of preventable causes, okay? That's a horrific statistic. It's a statistic. Think of all the tragedies behind that. Six million families every year with teeny little babies and little kids who die of causes that are preventable. This happens by and large in sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Asia, especially South Asia, and parts of Latin America. And for each baby that passes away, there's a hundred others that suffer who don't die but who grow up stunted with medical issues, mental issues, and so on and so forth. The issue there is less cost. It's the bigger issue is lack of access. Because when you get into areas like this, you're talking abject uh, poverty, no electricity for much of the day, healthcare clinics that don't work, medical personnel that don't exist in these places, and if they exist, they don't show up for work. So it's access to care, it's cost of care, and it's quality of care. Those are the three things we have to hit. AI can play a big role in helping to overcome these. So some of the things, for example, that we're working on at my AI Institute, and these are different kinds of issues than the ones we deal with in the US and the UK and so on. So tuberculosis is the largest infectious disease killer in the world today. It kills close to two million people a year, more than HIV and malaria combined. So we're trying, we're using AI to help detect tuberculosis earlier by analyzing coughing sounds on a smartphone using AI algorithms. Uh, we are using AI to help detect tuberculosis patients who are likely to fall off treatment, similar to what you just mentioned, because those patients are the ones that become multiple drug resistant to TB. Then it's really tough dealing with them. Um, and even though overall, globally, the, the incidence of TB is kind of flattening out, the cases of multiple drug-resistant TB are exploding. In countries like India, multiple MDR TB, as it's called, accounts for only 5% of the cases, but it accounts for over half the cost incurred nationally on tuberculosis. So those are some of the kinds of applications we're working on. High-risk pregnancy. You know, in these very low-income uh, settings, you have a number of mothers who, because of lack of care, lack of nutrition, et cetera, have high-risk pregnancies, and those are the ones where the children are likely to die or the mother's likely to die in childbirth. We are using AI to try and help those, identify those cases earlier, and even within high-risk pregnancies, which are the cases that are more extreme, which are less extreme, how do you intervene, what do you do, et cetera. So I think as we talk about advancing healthcare around the world, and meeting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for 2030, and health is a huge part of it. If we don't find a way to address this bottom two or three billion people in the world who really suffer, then we're not, you know, we're not, we're not serving humanity properly. Mm. I think that's fascinating. Uh, it, it, 
is there is there an argument that in fact though that we should also be thinking not just about this is like almost on a charitable basis, but actually if we do transform the cost to treat somebody or the cost to image somebody or the cost to get somebody to stick to their, um, their meds, uh, then in fact we are opening up uh, two-thirds of the world to a new market that we can make it cheaper but also democratize it. Is that not the ultimate objective of what we're trying to do in healthcare? I think there's a value of human life, but in terms of just a, one thing I thought to riff on what you're saying, with the doctor, the number one question I get from people is, you're taking my job away when I meet medical doctors. It's just really what's better, a centaur, the AI plus uh, medical doctor in the loop is great, especially on all the corner cases. There aren't enough doctors in the world. We do have the telecommunications infrastructure and having, that, there's a great value there. Um, if, 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 we, if we can pull it, pull it off, and then there's plenty of work for you to do in all time zones, 24 seven, all the time. Um, if the value of the, the half of the world is the market, yeah, I mean, maybe you have to just, for the economists, we could just justify it in. 90% of adolescents are living in the developing world, so it's the mm. future, too. We're not having enough babies. Well, you know, I just want to bring up a statistic that I think is, is important. It costs $2.5 billion to bring a drug to market in 10 to 15 years. Now, there's 300 million people that are suffering from rare diseases that, given that economic model, there's no chance that they'll ever have a treatment, you know, in their lifetimes. And that has to change. And I think what's really encouraging right now is when you look at a problem from a multidisciplinary approach, like the human mind can only process so many pieces of information. And no matter what it, how much of an expert you are, you know, as a biologist, a chemist, and you're trying to, you know, design and develop the next drug, if you can imagine bringing together teams like cross-functional teams with domain expertise across AI, machine learning, and all those other disciplines that normally develop drugs, you bring all of that together with, you know, powerful algorithms and you, you you know, find correlations and connections within that data that weren't, you know, that no one was able to find without technology. And you have the potential of coming up with personalized treatments that work for individual patients mm. and really trans, you know, really changes the outcome for the, the 300 million people, for instance, that suffer from rare diseases. And under this economic model, unless there's major disruption, will never have a treatment in their lifetime. That's absolutely true. I want to talk a bit about, you mentioned the big thing, personalized medicine, which I think uh, a lot of us are um, expecting is going to become the norm. Um, of course, if we live in a pan panacea where we have managed to, for everybody, irrespective of where they were born, uh, managed to get to the point where you don't die of tuberculosis, you don't have a one in three chance of dying, giving child, uh, giving childbirth uh, in childbirth. Um, a lot of these, a lot of these sort of fundamental things that we take for granted, um, have gone. You know, like for everybody, we we we're left with cancer and the diseases of aging. Okay, um, it sounds great, but here's something that I've been uh, worried about: is that we are then left with the diseases that are going to take more than simple blockbusters to treat us all. They're going to be multiple adaptive combinations of therapies that require very frequent uh, scanning, that require, you know, every time we go to the loo, we'll probably have something sequenced about us in order to then change what we do or whatever um, supplements we're then meant to take. Um, but the question that I've got is, okay, that's great, but how do we, how do we even distribute the, the, the value there? How do, we, how do we actually get the money back to the people that are developing those, uh, those innovations? Because it's very easy for me as, let's say, Mr. Drug Company, and I say, okay, I've given you a thousand doses of this, pay me that, but how on earth do we actually make personalized medicine a reality in, the, in a commercial sense? The short answer is, in the very near term, we can. Um, at Samsung, right now, we have the world's largest installed capacity to make biologics drugs. 
we also have the world's largest portfolio of biosimilars. And the thing I spend a lot of time on right now is gene and cell therapies. We're just looking forward to the next decade or two. All right, and I personally have a point of view that we talk too much about personalized medicine thinking that we're developing drugs for an N of one, for one person. It's never gonna happen. In fact, the first two gene therapies that are available out there um, right now, cell therapies that are available out there right now is for um, cancer, it's CAR-T, where basically you take blood from the patient's body, you fix the drugs, fix these cells, essentially, um, and then put it back. Right now, that therapy costs anywhere between a quarter of a million dollars to two million dollars, depending on which indication it is. And the limitation right there is just the processing of the blood, right, and then getting it back to the patient. It's actually not really the cost of getting the gene inserted into that patient's cells. So the real challenge I see going forward in the next two decades around gene and cell therapy and enabling um, personalized medicine is how do we actually create large enough segments of these different kinds of patients? And then hopefully with some basic genomic sequencing and so forth, if you can say, Jack, you're in segment A, Mary Lou, you're in segment Z, and then we'll have 20 different segments and 20 different kinds of medications that's more tailored than a one size fit all treatment that we have right now. Right. We are still very, very far away from a single treatment for a single person. I, I'm struggling to keep up with one size fits all. Um, so if you're now saying to me that I have to think about 20 cohorts or maybe proper N of one medicine, which you're saying, and I tend to agree, probably in the short term might be impossible to actually do completely personalized medicine, but personalized enough. How do we change the way I'm taught? How do we change the way I'm practiced? What, are you guys just developing technologies or you're developing training schemes? What, what, what does the future of me look like? Well, I think it's both, but let me add another point to this whole uh, thing about innovation in medicine. I think we've heard some really interesting things over here about what's, what's happening at the genetic level, the protein level, etc. It's two other, I think, really interesting developments that are worth mentioning. So today, if I think of some of the most innovative healthcare companies, <clears throat> you know who I think of? Not just Merck and GSK and so on. I think of Google, Samsung, Apple, Microsoft, which are doing some really interesting things in terms of collecting your personal data to help figure out what your healthcare issues are. So there's a lot going on in that space, and over in a very short time frame, in the next two or three or four years, you're going to see these companies, again, Google, uh, Microsoft, and so on, coming out with some really interesting offerings in the healthcare space. Not to worry about your job, that's still safe, okay? I'm still worried. <laughs> the second thing <laughs> is there are some now very large foundations, uh, and also people like the World Health Organization, working on getting personalized medicine to the point where it's not just about your DNA and what works on your DNA. Certainly that's a big part of it. But where do you live? What's the water quality in that region? What's the air quality in that region? What's your diet like? What are your neighbors like? And all of this is available in different data sets. And if we can put this together, it takes personalized medicine to a whole new level. It's your DNA plus your environment, your habit, your diet, et cetera, which I think gets this to a whole new level. Mm. Now, you raised a great point, Jack, training for all of this. It'll come. As technologies develop, training schemes get developed, these are sharp companies that know what they're doing, and they know that the only way to get this technology actually used in the real world is to get people trained, to get people comfortable with these technologies. Mm. Yeah. I'll just add something to that. Um, the human body is like the most complex machine that we know of, 37 trillion cells. So when something's wrong with the human body, it becomes the perfect machine learning problem. So what you were describing is all those aspects that you know represent the environment which I grew up in and combine that with my DNA and my medical history, if you could have access to all that data, you have a much higher likelihood of number one, diagnosing what's wrong with me, and then also coming up with a suitable treatment. So I think that that's the, we're here to talk about AI and machine learning and the power of that um, and the impact on, on, on medicine. Um, something really exciting happened last week along these lines. Um, there was an announcement around um, a, a technology that was deployed that allowed you know, competing pharmaceutical companies 
to um, use the same algorithms to um, train and use to machine learn on each other's data without um, giving away any proprietary secrets. So it's really exciting use of blockchain and you know the capability to understand and train on other companies' data so that you have access to more information about patients and then you know enabling that to be you know used for a global benefit versus just the benefit of one um, pharmaceutical company. So there's a lot of potential, but the human body is perfect machine learning um, opportunity. Hmm. I mean, I, I'm still I'm, I'm still slightly worried. I'm getting less worried by, um, as a result of this uh, these few minutes. But I, wa I want to just go back to this point about uh, like training, because at the moment, you know, most of my colleagues, if they're presented with uh, an open water scan, which they may well do in the not so distant future, you never know, somebody might buy a headband and start doing MRIs on themselves, it's very, very true, or um, some, yeah, it could well be. When, when's that coming out, Mary Lou? When can I get my MRI headband beta? Depends on the regulatory environment, but uh, it depends what the claims are. If you just say it's an image, it's a repeatable image, uh, we have an example, optical coherence tomography went through FDA in six months, 25 years ago. In fact, I was in the ER with a friend last weekend and they wanted to do an ultrasound on his eye and I didn't want to be picky. I'm like, can I ask a question? I'm not challenging your authority. I just, for my identification, why are you not doing OCT while you're doing ultrasound? And the answer was, because we don't have OCT in the ER. I'm just gonna say that again. The answer was, because we don't have it in the, like, last weekend at UCSF um, uh, Hospital, nine of the 10 MRI scanners were down. So there was a long line to get into, like, it's so expensive, the liquid heal, it, like, it's the no brain, like, to read the image, that's not a hard problem, and, and we've got a significant amount of AI talent. If the doctor can't read the image, fine. We ha the AI is good. If you want the radiologist, great. I think one of the things is if you see something, you trigger in the U.S. Um, a something where you ha it's interpreted that you have to do a biopsy if you see something. But that's because it's so expensive. What if you just watch it for a while? Like sure, thermometer. But is I'm, I'm still I'm still getting it? lots of I'm still getting lots of your scans like that. I'm, I'm picturing three years from now, right? I'm getting lots of scans sent to me on WhatsApp by a patient who's monitoring something inside their head. Um, this is a whole new sort of level of me having to interact because I'm still the gatekeeper. I, I'm still the one whose neck is on the line. It's my kind of insurance, if you like, if if I get stuff wrong about exactly. whether I operate on you or not. And just to be clarify, it is actually their necks on the line. They're the ones that die. And as a patient, you know, that's my issue is I don't want to die even if anybody makes a mistake in the system. And so, like, like you can do, like, a time lapse. Like, boy, that's getting bigger. Maybe I should talk to Jack. Boy, that's getting smaller. Maybe. I mean, we're already starting to do that now. I mean, people are using Apple Watches to, or various other things that preceded that, whether it was Vital Connect or cardio and saying, hey, look, here's data, and this is actually clinical-grade data. But the point I'm trying to make is that we also, I think, need to help uh, folk like me to be able to actually understand and act upon it. Because I think what you said is interesting because your job is on the line for not understanding the data they send Exactly. You. That could be fixed legally too, right? Like, because, you know, one of the things I, I watched one of the Elizabeth Holmes movies, it turns out with that board of directors in the state of Arizona, anyone can get any blood test they want without a medical doctor's permission. Um, we have Theranos to thank for that. That's one interesting thing that they did. Because as a patient, I, I'm speaking now as a brain tumor survivor who takes a dozen medications every day, and I'm not compliant because I'm too lazy to fill the subscriptions, prescriptions. I'm not compliant because it's too hard to get them filled, and that's a long story. But here's the thing is like, if you present with four or five symptoms, 80% of the time it's one of five things, let it be. And 20% of the time, it's one of four million things. And you remain undiagnosed for a long time with a lot of pain. And people think you're a hypochondriac. 
That's what I suffered with for a decade before my brain tumor was finally discovered, which is what a lot of people suffer from. And because, Jack, you can't figure it out. It's okay. Like, it's hard to, f it's almost impossible to figure this stuff out. That's what all of this data can help us sort of at least lower the number of those and sh think of as if is there a way to test in between the ones that are most likely. And it's going to take a while to get there, but getting there is important with the data and getting you, getting your neck off of the, the chopping block is also very important or it won't happen. I, I have two answers for you, Jack. One is an analogy. Back in the early 90s, I helped um, a company to launch mini minimally invasive surgeries, laparoscopic surgery. So literally within a span of a year, we took penetration from zero to almost 80% around the world, right? And because we built training centers around the world and made it to their clinicians' um, incentive to go and get trained on how to do these particular procedures, right? So if it's important enough, these companies will figure out a way to train the clinicians on how to do it. The second part is frankly, with this thing, um, the AI will help you do your job. I'll give you an, an example. If you're an orthopedic surgeon nowadays, you tend to spend your morning doing procedures. By the time you get back to your office, three or four o'clock in the afternoon, you're seeing a bunch of patients sitting in your practice waiting to see you because they're concerned about a procedure that was done in the past. The first two things that you do when you go in is you take off the dressing to see if there's a, a, an infection of the wound, right? And then the second is you're checking to see if there's a range of motion that is being regained after a hip or a knee replacement, for example. So with this phone, with this app that I just tried to show you, instead what we do is we have the patient just take a picture of their wound. That image then either gets analyzed by a machine learning algorithm to basically say it's fine or it's, or it's not, or that image can go to your practice where an assistant can look at that picture and say come in or don't worry about it. And range of motion, this, this phone here has all kinds of sensors. So instead of having to put a pull tractor up to my knee to try to measure how much I can move, just do it like this. The phone sensors will help you measure the angle, and therefore if you're getting your range of motion back. So hmm. technology can help the patients just the same way technology can help you with your job and train you on how to do it too. So again, just to highlight the differences, uh, and differences in both challenges and opportunities between the developed world applying AI in healthcare in the developed uh, world versus the developing world. So we talked about some of that a little bit earlier, but in terms of challenges, here we have huge amounts of data, you know, in all the developed world, medical data that we can analyze, et cetera. When you get into these low and uh, middle income countries, um, A, you find that a lot of the AI based solutions that are developed here don't work quite as well over there because Diseases express themselves differently in different populations, mm. right? Different genetic characteristics, different environmental issues, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to develop solutions locally. The big problem in countries like this is you've got very little data that's actually accurate and reliable. So medical data, even in a big country like India, 1.3 billion people, very tough to come by. And when you do come by it, very high degree of inaccuracy, a lot of fudge data, et cetera. So how do you build the algorithms initially? Not easy, but there are ways to slowly overcome that. Even when you build the right models, the next problem, and you, Jack, alluded to this earlier, is trying to find commercial models that are sustainable, commercial meaning come up with a for-profit company that can sell this stuff, and trying to sell this to families that are making literally two or 3,000 pounds a year, not a month, 70 or 80% of that income goes into buying food. One health issue in the family basically wipes you out, and all these families have health issues because they have nut nutrition problems and bad water and this and that. So, very f so I've come across, and I've been doing this for a while, and I've spoken to people at the Gates Foundation and WHO and so on, all of us have come across very few commercial models that actually work at this level of income. And that level of income below two or three dollars a day is where the real healthcare challenges are. 
So, so again, there's a huge opportunity, and I, I truly do believe AI gives us a way forward over here that we've never had before. Mm. But we need to be very intentional, we need to pick the right problems, we need to pick the right partners, and then over time, hopefully, the right commercial models will develop. We, um, we've got a few minutes left, so um, I've got a few thoughts uh, which I'll come to at the end as a result of what you guys have said. But um, before we do, I, I, I want to talk about a question that has become quite uh, like talked about a lot in the last, in the last year, and that is um, in and around aging. Um, we've touched a little upon a little bit about complex chronic diseases and so forth. But um, a lot of people are really kind of in our circle, are, are, are almost fighting more for immortality than they are for equality and basic things. Um, I wanted to know, as people who are in this very privileged setting that we are in, uh, who've worked for big companies, who, who don't really have the same problems as those who uh, get malaria and tuberculosis and so on, what is your gut feeling on this kind of seemingly growing obsession we have on reaching that escape velocity and living forever? Should we be directing our technologies to those things, even if it is a massive market? I think you have more billionaires now than uh, most any time in history. I guess if you do dollar corrected, it's gilded age. So that's what a billionaire wants. So that's, that's why it's being funded. But maybe we can all benefit from it. But you know, your point, <laughs> you can say it again, but yeah, like half of humanity is, this doesn't address them, but I don't know if you can stop it, so how can we harness it? Mm. Well, senescence is a factor in a lot of disease, you know, stem cell death, and um, I think that, you know, like you said, it's, I don't think it's moral that we're spending, you know, like people are focused on longevity as an outcome, but if you can understand why a cell goes senescent and why it dies, you can treat a lot of diseases, like you can maybe reverse heart disease. And, you know, there's a lot of um, good things that can come out of this. But, you know, we've got to get to a world where we're not all, you know, just in our microcosm bubble here. You know, the we really live in a privileged environment, all of us here. And we need to think about that beyond, you know, our our world. You know, I am personally very optimistic. I mean, in spite of all of these challenges that we have, I think we're living at a unique time when there's a huge amount of innovation happening. Uh, and not just in the developed world, there's a huge amount of innovation in countries like India and Brazil and China, obviously, et cetera. There's a huge amount of entrepreneurship happening in these same countries. And entrepreneurs like Mary Lou and you know, many of us are the ones who drive commercial models. And I think there's an increasing sense everywhere that I go of people that we can't forget the half of humanity that's really not, that doesn't have access to all the things we do. So there's an increasing number of people focused on this. There are transformative uh, technologies like AI coming, uh, coming through. And now more than ever before, governments in these countries like India and Nigeria and so on, both at the federal level, the central level, as well as at the state and local level, are now open more than ever before to letting technology come in. They would resist it for a long time. Yeah. So I think we've got this great confluence of positive factors, and I'm, I'm confident that over the next five, seven, 10 years, we will see a huge amount of progress. Kong, a, a, closing, a closing thought. I share Sadil's um, optimism. I think we stand at a very interesting time in healthcare. Both the life sciences, the things that are being done in the labs and so forth, are helping us improve the quality of the years that we are here. Right? I have never really focused any of my research or anything like that on extending life. All that I've tried to do is to improve the life, the quality of the life that's here. And I think the advent of AI really just turbocharges and enhances that by a hundred times. Well, I think it was, uh, was it Spider-Man said that with great power comes great responsibility? And I think with a lot of these technologies, um, we will have the opportunity to do the responsible thing and not just have a few of us live longer or live better, but actually make that a new market and something which brings equality for a great many of us um, more than just those in this room. Um, 
And I'm really pleased to say that there are four people here who are working towards that. And I thank you very, very much, um, Mary Lou, Joe, Sunil, and Kong, for spending the time with us and also traveling an extremely long way um, whilst you're trying to do this really important work rather than just talking about it. Um, please join me in uh, 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 saying thank you to this wonderful panel and thank you for listening.